Rick, I'm thrilled to have you with us, and this is an ETF show, but I have to ask you about the Fed because uh, it has been a wild last week. Of course, we got a surprisingly dovish Jerome Powell last Wednesday at the press conference, and then the days that followed, what we've heard from John Williams, Raphael Bostic, uh, Austin Goolsby, et cetera, seemingly pushing back against how the market interpreted Jerome Powell. What do you make of all of it? It was wild. I mean, the last couple of weeks have been uh, have been pretty incredible. I, so, so the Powell. I mean, I thought what was interesting, most interesting about Powell, is there was no pushback on financial conditions easing, and it, which was pretty stark contrast to where they were a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, or no reference to we still are fighting inflation aggressively. I mean, I, I was pretty surprised by it. But then, you know, markets took it dovishly, and in including pricing in that the Fed would start cutting in March, which I still think is early. And then, uh, but then he said, I thought the one that was significant is John Williams coming out. That was unscheduled and coming out and saying that the markets are being a bit presumptuous. So anyway, I think the market reaction pulling back a bit today, reflective of, uh, I don't think Chair Powell meant to be that aggressive about starting to cut this quickly. And so I think today's uh, retrenchment makes, uh, makes some sense to me. And you are seeing the markets uh, recalibrate a bit to that. Let's wrap this into the reason we do have you, which, of course, is uh, you launching your second ETF. Of course, uh, you've managed fix fixed income for quite a long time, but you're relatively new to the ETF wrapper. And last week, you launched the BlackRock Total Return ETF. Of course, you manage total return strategies in mutual funds. And when I think of total return, I really think of a go-anywhere type of strategy. And against that backdrop that you just described uh, with the Fed, if you can go anywhere in the fixed income market right now, where's the most opportunity? So, I mean, the one thing about total return, I mean, we're doing it, uh, quite frankly, because we think the demand in this wrapper and this type of wrapper for many that are using models, and quite frankly, after a year like this, where people are looking at a balanced equities, total return makes a lot of sense. So the total return tends to be, we still model it to the aggregate index, but we're trying to outperform the index. So what do you do today? Listen, some of the credit sectors make still make sense today. Uh, both the investment grade market we think makes sense, a bit of high yield we think makes sense today, and, uh, and agency mortgages that, um, you know, where we think there's some real value today. The, um, to take advantage of. Where we don't think there's a lot of value is what we just talked about, the front end of the yield curve getting ahead of the Fed, presumably. That we've started to pull back on and we're underweight there. But gosh, we still think the spread sectors, you can create a bit more income than the index. And that's where we think there's the best value today. Rick, we recently caught up with J.P. Morgan Asset Management's Brian Leake, who, of course, is the global head of ETF solutions there. And he discussed the room that's available to grow in active fixed income ETFs. Take a listen. And you could see the ETF industry double from kind of seven to 14, 15 trillion dollars. And I think active could be 10 to 20 percent of that. So there's your 1.5 to 3 trillion dollars in active ETFs. Big starter there is on the fixed income side. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the thing that I hear from investors mm -hmm. is they're just underwhelmed with how fixed income indexes are constructed. Mm -hmm. um, a fixed income index is going to weight the heaviest debtor as the biggest component. Mm -hmm. And that's not how I or you probably think about yeah. your fixed income exposure in your portfolios. And so yeah. when you can use active management to correct for some of those things, provide yeah. that outperformance. Rick, I want to get your thoughts on how big you think this market can get now that the Fed pivot is happening. Well, so by the way, I agree with everything that was just said. I, so let's say a couple of things. Firstly, you know, active management fixed income generally outperforms. I, I've seen numbers from Morningstar that show that, uh, that something like 80, 85 percent of managers outperform in fixed income. The reason why is you get in fixed income, there's 68,000 securities. It's pretty extraordinary versus the S&P 500. There are so many unique things you could take advantage of in the fixed income market. Your ability to build income and then manage your beta in fixed income is, is one of the, what I think, one of the key uh, tools and objectives you can create, and, uh, which I think, I think makes a lot of sense over time. So I think active, active fixed income is going to grow quite a bit. I mean, the growth of the mutual fund industry in fixed income has been huge. And, you know, we launched, as you said, we launched our Bink ETF back in May, and we're pretty, uh, it's pretty impressed with how fast it's growing. And it's, you know, that's a fund or an ETF where you can put a lot of income into it. We, you know, we were running 7% with a drop in rates. We're still running mid to high sixes, which is super attractive. And, you know, one thing about fixed income, it's really hard for the average investor to find unique commercial mortgage securities, unique CLO securities. It tends to be a more opaque market. 
And so the ability to do that, create a lot of yield without a lot of volatility, is something that people crave from the uh, both retail, model-driven, and institutional. And Rick, earlier you mentioned the short end of the curve and um, dura low duration. Um, I want to get your take on TLT. This fascinated us all year. Um, we had $20 billion poured into it, and it kept going down and down. I think it lost 18%. People kept going in and in. It finally worked about in the past month. What do you do now? Um, just curious if you like the long end of the curve and TLT in particular and what you made of this year and all the flows that, w that went into it. <laughs> You've highlighted what I think is it's truly been the most curious thing. The, the demand, and like you say, I mean, the money was coming in, the markets were going, were going down, and, and, the, and the money kept coming in. It was, it was really curious. Listen, I don't think the long end of the yield curve today is very attractive. You talk about a 4% long bond. Uh, when you can get more than that in the front and you don't have to take the, uh, the, the duration risk of being in the back end of the curve. The thing that's pretty incredible, if you go back in history and think about a 4% long bond, that's not that attractive. You think about what normal term premium is, uh, you think you know, relative to history, that's not that attractive at all. It's where, where it's really attractive. I said I didn't like the very front end, I don't like the very long end, it means I like the middle. And I, you know, I really like the belly of the yield curve where you get, that's the fulcrum point for when the, the Fed starts easing. That's where the forwards are really attractive, and, that, and that's where you can create a lot of return, and certainly on a risk-adjusted basis. Like you say, the demand that's come in on the back end of the yield curve has been one of the most curious things that I've seen. Now, one thing that is that it certainly is happening, pension funds that have done well in their equities can now lock in these yields. So there's some of that that's going on. But the sheer size of that demand has been has been truly, uh, truly eye popping. OK, guys, write that down. It's the belly is where you want to be uh, when we finally get to that pivot point. But Rick, I want to talk a little bit more about you because, OK, you launched Bank uh, back in May, I believe it was. That was very exciting for the ETF industry. Now you're out with uh, your total return ETF. Again, like I mentioned, a strategy that you're very familiar with, have been managing in a mutual fund wrapper. Would you ever consider converting some of your mutual fund strategies just into ETFs? So listen, I mean, they're different. They're different products and different wrappers. I mean, one thing in a mutual fund is I do a lot of things. We're able to do a lot of things around sort of bespoke financing. I do a lot of hedging in the mutual funds that allows me to keep our volatility relative to our relative to our risk, relative to our return at a reasonable level. So I think, listen, I think the mutual fund industry is going to survive and live live on for years. And, you know, you can run a really, really effective strategy in mutual funds. You know, we, we run a fund called uh, SIO, which is our strategic income fund, that is allows us to create, I mean, we've created almost double the return of the ag at half the volatility for years and years. And it's because I can use so many tools to do it. But listen, I think, I think people really like the facility of using ETFs, put them into models, use them for tax strategies. So my sense is mm. the growth will, will clearly happen in ETF form. But I don't think uh, I don't think the mutual fund industry is going away anytime soon. And quite frankly, I find it super effective to uh, to manage uh, to manage portfolios with today. You know, as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about how in the ETF world, there are definitely natives and then there are tourists, uh, meaning there are ETF people and then there are people with ETFs. So here on this show, Eric and Katie are the natives. <laughs> I'm the tourist. Um, but increasingly, the people uh, with ETFs are now heavyweights in the bond world, right? Of course, we have uh, Rick Reeder, who we're in conversation with right now. But we also saw uh, PIMCO's Dan Iveson, for example, also come out to the ETF wrapper this year. So, Rick... What do you notice, what do you observe as a tourist that the natives don't necessarily appreciate? So, so I'd say a couple of things. First of all, I've been, uh, you know, my funds, I've used ETFs for I don't know how many years. I mean, they're incredibly effective to get in and out of. And I use the high yield market to uh, use HYG constantly, LQD, constantly manage my beta. You know, when I'm waiting for new issues to come and I'm trying to get some exposure, I'll use HYG when I'm trying to ramp up or ramp down. So anyway, ETFs are super effective and, I, and, uh, and you know, we'll continue to, to utilize them. Listen, I think the thing that is being, you know, having managed so many portfolios in different forms, in many forms over the years, you know, you get a sense for how do you run the style a little bit differently in the, in the ETF for total return, for the for the uh, for BlackRock total return ETF, for bank, you know, I'm using more uh, products that are more transparent so that people can replicate them that like to put them into models. Um, but, uh, but you know, to keep, you know, one of the things we're doing, keep the yield up, 
keep the diversification up in uh, in the ETF and do it similar to what you would do in a mutual fund. But you know, there's you know people desire all types of forms to uh, to invest, and this is this one I think is going to continue to grow. And and like I say, the amount that I trade, not just in by the way, not just in fixed income in a lot of the equity ETFs. I mean, they're incredibly effective in a portfolio to manage your portfolio allocations. 